This is the Little Moments Count radio podcast, created in partnership with community radio stations throughout Minnesota. Each episode, you'll hear interviews with early childhood experts on how to support the important brain development that takes place in the first 1,000 days of life, just through Little Moments every day. Learn more at littlemomentscount.org slash podcast. Welcome to the Narrative on KRSM Radio, where we amplify the voices, stories, cultures, and conversations that are happening in our neighborhood. We focus on communities that have been historically ignored, misrepresented, and erased by traditional media. I'm your host, Andrea Pierre, and today I'm so excited to have our guests. They are the producers and uh, they produced a professional short film called Reflecting on Anti-Bias Education in Practice, the Early Years. Um, it is John Nemo, John Nimmo, excuse me, John Nimmo, and Debbie Lee Keenan. And I knew I was going to do that the minute I said your <laughs> name, John. <laughs> <laughs> it's those days in this Mercury We're glad retrograde. To be. But We're I'm so glad happy to, to have you on. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so if you don't know who John and Debbie are, John is a PhD and a professor in early childhood education. He has an inclusive education online at the um, College of Education. Previously, he was an associate professor in family studies and executive director of the Child Study and Development Center at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, Dr. Nemo is uh, the co-author of three different books here. And Debbie Lee Keenan is the co-director of Anti-Bias, Leaders, ECE, and a lecturer, consultant, and author. Currently residing in Seattle, Washington, she was the director of the Elliott Pearson Children's School of Tufts University in Medford, Massachusetts from 1996 to 2013, in addition to teaching in the Elliott Pearson Department of Child Study and Human Development at Tufts University. She has been a member of the early childhood faculty at Lesley University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And she is a former preschool special education and elementary school teacher. She consults and lectures locally, nationally, and internationally. So just welcome you both for being here on the narrative with me this morning. I know it's kind of early for you all there in, in, on the West Coast, but how are you doing this morning? Great. And just so thank you so much for inviting us. It's We always love to dialogue with people all over. We always learn more from the conversation. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. And here, here in Portland, it's sunny and beautiful. <laughs> so I'm glad to be here. Yes. Uh, we finally had our little break of... Uh, fall weather in Minnesota after a long heat wave. So I'm grateful to have the windows open and turn off the AC here. Um, so I just wanted to know, you know, we always have these certain questions that we ask everyone for a little moment's counts. And, you know, this is our episode that we always do. And this episode of the narrative is presented in partnership with Little Moments Count and Little Moments Count is a statewide collaborative here in Minnesota that focuses on helping parents and caregivers learn about the importance of brain development in the first three years of a child's life. And, you know, nearly 80% of brain growth happens in the first thousand days and small moments of interaction like talking, playing, reading, and singing help create the pathways that build a child's brain during this early stage of life. Um, for more information, you can visit littlemomentscount.org. And, you know, the narrative is excited to be partnering with Little Moments Count to host conversations focused on early childhood development. And each month we're going to be hosting a new guest to talk about their involvement in Little Moments Count and how they view the role of early childhood development, creating bright futures and strong communities. And strong communities were definitely reflected in this short film that I, you know, rewatched again for the third time, reflecting on anti-bias education and practice the early years. Um, you know, you really were touching on so much with these fantastic educators. Um, how did you find these people? Like, how did you get to this beautiful school full of educators here? And 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 how did you, you know, convince them to let you watch them work? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think we, we both um, see these teachers as very brave and, you know, we, we honor them wherever, whenever we can. Um, we were certainly looking for teachers who uh, were able to talk about their practice, you know, and reflective. We had connections um, uh, with directors of programs, and we visited actually a number of programs ourselves 
Um, and then we also got recommendations from other colleagues about teachers who were not only doing this work in their classroom, but could talk about it and, um, and also were um, comfortable with talking about themselves. Because I think one of the things you see in this film is people speaking from their identities and being very conscious of those identities and how they they bring their heritage and their their um their own socialization into the classroom um so but but it was not and then of course uh, we also work with them particularly debbie in seattle we work with the teachers in um, their own centers over the course of a couple of months uh kind of in a way doing professional development and having an exchange with them and i think uh, our goal and debbie can talk to this was that this would be something that was as valuable for the teachers as it was for us. So we didn't see this as we're coming in to take something from you, but in fact, this is going to be a reciprocal experience um, uh, um, being involved in the film. Yeah, I think we really wanted teachers that were accessible. Because so I think one of the messages of the film is that enterprise education is doable. And so we were looking for teachers that Yes, they were in programs that were committed to doing this because it's very hard to do this in isolation. It's possible. We were looking for supportive communities, finding teachers that were uh, approachable, accessible, and as John said, willing to share who they are. Also the challenges that it's about taking risks, being vulnerable, making mistakes, um, and the piece about working with them beforehand was also about developing trust. If we were going to be invited into their classrooms, they had to get to know us. So um, that was, I think, a big part of meeting with them, getting to know them. So they felt comfortable. It's very hard what we've learned as filmmakers to have teachers share their hearts and souls um, on film like that. It is. And, you know, just kind of watching the teachers work, they were doing, you know, we're in the Midwest here in Minnesota. They were doing all the things that were like, oh my God, like don't point out those things. They were pointing out all the differences. And we, you know, growing up here from Minnesota, I'm like, oh my goodness, we were told never to do that. Like how like refreshing in a way, but scary to think that we are going to point out to children because children will point it out anyway. But like, you know, when I was younger, it was like, shh, don't do that. We were always shushed. We were always told, don't do that. It was not polite not to do that. But these teachers were actually not only encouraging it, but, um, you know, finding ways to really find healthy ways to talk about it and, and encouraging the, the language and the verbiage in a great way. Um, how were, I know mistakes were made, <laughs> you know, mm, yeah. when you're doing uh, that. That's part yeah. of the work. <laughs> yeah, how I think you, I... How do you yeah. come back from that, from those mistakes, you know, and what kind of mistakes did happen that you can tell us about? You know, what, some of the dialogues with the interviews with the teachers, particularly the group dialogue, where there's a couple of teachers talking about the experience with using the non-binary uh, persona doll in the classroom, was trying to relate that um, this can be a messy um, process and we don't always know how to respond but no response is always a response that's one of the things we always say with teachers when you don't respond when you shush up that doesn't stop the curiosity of the child what they're actually doing when they're shushed by adults the child is trying to say well what does that mean is this something I'm not supposed to think about is this something I should be worried about um, is this something I should be frightened about um, so these were we we wanted the teachers to be able to show that they thought long and hard about what they were doing. Um, they were not always certain they got it right. There's a couple of places, there's a number of places in the film where teachers are going, well, we don't quite get it right all the time. Um, there was a teacher, one of the teachers talking about using different languages in the classroom. So I think we did want to express that to teachers that you do have to start somewhere. And you aren't always going to get it right, but you be intentional. Um, and then you can always go back to children. You, mm -hmm. you can come back later and say, you know, I've thought about that more. And or maybe you bring a book, a picture book in that opens up that conversation. So um, we, we, type, we tend to think about the teachers not only looking for those openings where children are asking questions and talking about things, but also that their environment should provoke 
these kind of discussions. I mean, provoke in a kind of a challenge or open up a discussion um, that, you know, you're not just doing this passively, that you're actually saying, let's uh, invite the children to ask questions and to wonder. And I think that it's it's okay to make mistakes. That's an important part of learning. And we know that's okay with children, right? We know children learn when they make mistakes, when they fall down, they get up. I think it's much harder for adults to feel comfortable doing that. But um, I think that concept, we, we will learn, We growth happens when we make mistakes. So we can't be afraid of them. We have to lean into that idea. So I think the teachers in the film, we, we talked about that. We tried to make it a safe space for them to make mistakes. Um, even when they're knowing they're being filmed, you know, we, we won't put everything in. We'll check with you about that. So making them feel comfortable, um, although everything in the film was very, we they weren't, act, no one was acting. This was really <laughs> what the kids were doing, all of that. Um, I think the other ex concrete example is in that goal four, the one about spreading the word and activism around where the children are responding to the Black Lives Matter protests. Yes. That to me is very, so powerful. And when, you know, you have the teachers talking to each other, you know, that, um, you know, I don't know, because they're just coming back. It's during the pandemic, pandemic. We filmed that in August 2020. And, you know, the child comes in and says, you know, what they see outside their window, what's good, you know, what's going on. And, and then the teachers were reflecting, right? They're saying, yeah. I'm not sure, should I do this? Talks to her colleague, Brian. I'm, I'm, really, gl I'm really glad you brought that up, though, Debbie, because, um, I wanted to touch on that because it kind of goes to what John was saying too. Like the, the, the teachers didn't necessarily have the words and didn't know how to explain the murder of George Floyd by the Minneapolis police officers. And, you know, being here from Minneapolis, I was like, Oh God, how are they going to say this? Cause I'm seeing this thing that we've lived through mm -hmm. being interpreted by the world over and over and over again, as a Minneapolis resident, you know, and as a mother and everything. Um, it's very interesting to see how it's interpreted by other people. And, I love the fact that this student came in and said, okay, the moment is now because I want to talk about it at school when it's like it's amongst my friends. Like kids are so beautiful like that. And they're just like, look, this is what happened. And, you know, I'm black and, <laughs> you know, and I love that the, the child brought it, the student brought it to the forefront right away. So they had to deal with it. And one thing for sure that I realized, um, as a, as a mother who grew, who lives here in Minneapolis and my white counterparts weren't talking to their children about race at all. And we were, <laughs> and there was a divide because they thought that their children were too young to learn about these things. However, we were, and it's not like I was necessarily giving them all the brutalities of it, but I was letting them know that there were certain things that they needed to be aware of for how they behaved, for how they can find danger in certain situations as Black children. Um, and I loved how the response was to do like a little, little mini protest. And that was a very cute moment in the film. But yeah, I just, I did love that. That was a very poignant moment for us, for me too, just being a Minneapolis resident, seeing how that was reflected in the film. Um, were there pushback from some of the parents in the classroom after seeing what their children were learning? You know, our understanding is that the, the community was very supportive and the families were very supportive. But of course, these teachers, uh, they take the time to communicate with the families about what's happening and um, what they're talking about, no matter what it is, whether it's race or something else. So um, the parents are kind of informed and part of their own dialogue with the teachers about issues of bias and, and diversity and equity. Um, so that's sort of happening. That's, that's the situation it's happening in. And I think, you know, these teachers, they do, they're like any really good teacher, which is they begin by listening really deeply to the children. Mm -hmm. How are, what are they seeing? What are they making of the fact there were um, protests, very active protests going on near the school, around the school? What are they observing? Uh, what language do they have? What language don't they have? How can the teachers come in and provide information that sort of gets at where the children are trying to understand things and uh, make sense of it? Um, but obviously, in many, in some contexts, that may not be the case where parents are um, 
themselves very uncomfortable with talking about race, talking about their own identities. So there's a lot of pre-work to be done uh, with families about how can you engage in a conversation where you talk about your different identities, whether that's gender or class or, or race, and um, to keep that dialogue going. And of course, the teachers are also taking some risks here, right, mm -hmm. in terms of um, uh, being prepared to explain why they're doing what they're doing. But it's always great when the curriculum walks in the door through with the children. But even if it doesn't, I think that those teachers would have uh, found a way either through storybooks or through uh, conversation to begin to open up that conversation because they thought it was so important uh, what was happening in their community. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also the, you saw they, the director was, came in. So it's also, it wasn't just these teachers. And it happened in this particular classroom, what you see in the film, but they have their community, the colleagues, the, the director of the program and the families, you know, we're mentioning the families, but it has to make sure everyone, how are we thinking about this? What can we talk about? Um, what kinds of supports? What other information do we need to make sure the story makes sense? for the children and the questions that they're asking. So a lot of it I do believe stems from what children ask first, what they observe, what they're noticing, and then following their lead as it happens in this particular story, um, and then adding in other things that we know may be missing in the story that the children might not be aware of. Um, so bringing that in also other kinds of experiences. There's one part of that story. Well, actually, there's many parts of that story that didn't get into the film, you know, because there's such a short amount of time. And um, on our website, we have a little extended conversation mm -hmm. with another colleague who was black, who is black, sorry, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> continues to be black. And uh, he was involved as a um, uh, kind of a teacher in the classroom in a number of classrooms and he had he came in and talked to the kids about his own history of mm. protest um, and he was very involved in a lot of uh, important protests um, in San Francisco and so he shared about that so the children because part of this trying to understand what is a protest what is yep. this about what does it look like? What happens in it? And so he was able to ground them in a very personal experience. And they had a relationship with him as a human being, right? As a, a full human being who had many parts to who he mm -hmm. is. So that was one way that they did that. So there were this sort of these backstories of them trying to make meaningful connections with people in the community because Brian and Nadia, neither of them were black, although Nadia is Latin, Latinx. Um, so they were trying to make connections for the children and really um, give it more meaning um, than, than uh, maybe was completely evident in the film. Yeah. And those first person narratives are always so important to have, especially someone who's yeah. just really experiencing that. Um, so Debbie, you have a rich, you, you have a rich career in various educational settings and how does your experience in different roles from teaching to consulting inform your perspective on anti-bias education and how does it come through in the film? Yeah, well, um, yes, been in the field for many, many years, over 50 years in many different roles. And one of the questions, you know, we always would get, um, in all those roles is, you know, well, what does anti-bias education look like in the classroom? You know, so whether when I was a director or when I was a faculty member, so working with beginning teachers or veteran teachers, uh, because this was an important part of um, the mission of, of all the programs. And when I was in my own classroom, you know, it was always very important to me. Um, so I had that idea and then thinking about, you know, what is it, people were asking us, what does it look like? So that was one of the reasons we made the film was kind of a response to that. You could read an article, you could take a course, you could you know, go to a workshop, but it's not the same as seeing it. So that was one of the key pieces. And I think another um, important message from the film and from my experience thinking about it is that we want to make sure people thought that this was doable that children are capable. It's about paying attention, what's happening in the classroom, what children are noticing, what's happening in the community, my job as, so it's making a part of everything you're doing. So if you're a classroom teacher, that means making it a part of outdoor time, breakfast, you see that in the film, circle time. Um, it's not just, oh, check, what is it, check one and done, it's not that. If I'm a director, 
Okay. It's also making sure this is part of who I bring into my program. Who are the teachers I'm hiring? How am I supervising them? How am I giving, providing professional development? How am I engaging families? How is anti-bias education a part of our mission statement, our, um, our policies and procedures? So it's this idea of making it a part of whatever you do. It's a lens. Uh, it's not like a curriculum you buy and <laughs> incorporate. An anti-bias approach, it's a part of everything, whether you're a classroom teacher, whether you're a lead director, whether you're a consultant, whether you're a coach, um, even in business settings, I talk about, you know, that the film is a provocation and it's how do you bring this equity lens into your, whatever you're doing in your home, if you're a family, mm -hmm. in your business, or if you're, we're talking about education today or in your school. So, but we hope that the film is looked at as that as a way, how do I bring this into whatever I'm doing? It's definitely a, a whole community approach to build, make this framework work. You know, everybody has to have a buy-in for sure. And I think that is evident in the film for sure. Cause yeah, like you said, the director was there, the parents were buying in, the students were there buying in as well. Um, another moment that I did love in the film is when they were talking about like the non-binary or gender non-conforming things and the kids were like, oh yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're just so much more uh, valuable than we are as adults sometimes. <laughs> Um, I'm just wondering if you both can just provide some examples of the anti-bias strategies showcased in the films that teachers and educators and even parents maybe can apply immediately in their classrooms and at home. Yeah, well, I mean, this was an interesting thing for us because on one side, we did want to make sure people understood that they had to see what was in this film and apply it to their own setting in their own context who are the families who are the children uh, where are we in the world that it's going to look different and so there is this um, kind of uh, I suppose teacher being a researcher of sort of saying well how would I take these ideas and apply them into our setting so we're very mindful of that of sort of trying to get people to think well what would you do in your particular classroom and school given your families but having said that I would say I mean immediately uh, the activity um, that Veronica does around uh, self-identity portraits I mean that's a fairly common activity that you will see done and I think it can be done in um uh, more complex ways where you are really looking closely at who children are and bringing up issues of skin color and are you wearing glasses and so forth. So that's that's one activity that I think is a good entry point uh, for teachers who want to start exploring identity and also diversity, sort of wind mirrors, looking at yourself and windows looking out to other people not not our that's not our metaphor but uh, we, we borrow that metaphor and then the you know and, and then a more advanced level is the use of the persona doll the the non-binary doll which of course is a much more complex undertaking but there are uh, resources out there that we have in our guidebook to help people think about how you would do that so if you're really looking for um, I think the lovely thing about these persona dolls, which are sort of the toddler sized dolls that are kept especially for this process who have their own stories is you can have in those dolls things that reflect children in the classroom, but you can also have identities in the, and stories in those dolls of people who aren't in the classroom. So it's a way of bringing them in. So maybe, um, you know, uh, your children are all, living in uh, single ha family ha households or something. So you bring a doll in who looks like them, but then maybe is living in an apartment with an extended family. Mm -hmm. So that's a really powerful um, uh, piece that people see. And a lot of people, when they watch the film, go, oh, I've got to learn more about that and think about how I might use it. And of course, those dolls, Amaze Works, are right in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where they are. <laughs> um, I would add to that also the... Um, uh, of course, books, which everyone has in their home, you have them in school. So you can intentionally choose books that will also provide both those mirrors reflecting everyone in the community and those windows. Um, I also think you could actually pick any book up and just say, have children start to think about who's in the book, 
who's not in the book, who's missing. So often people say, what are those best books? And there are lots of organizations and lists where you can find some really wonderful books and, you know, that have written by um, own authors, right? Own authors and illustrators. Um, but also you can take a book and say, hmm, particularly with your older preschoolers, I would say, you know, kind of what's fair or unfair in this story? Uh, who's missing in it? Who's the main character? What happened? What if we change that character? And it wasn't, you know, this person, it was that person, you know, what would that tell us about the story? So uh, books are a wonderful way to get started since they're so accessible um, and a, a great resource. I'm a big book fan. <laughs> yeah, I think oh. it's important that there's not just activities it's also ways in which you teach like teaching strategies like Debbie's saying about asking good questions wondering along with children um, and also problem solving with them there's that episode where the children are um, the teacher poses to them they're using a balance board and she poses to them well how would we do this if you were using a wheelchair so mm -hmm. she's engaging the, the children in problem solving uh, around this challenging issue around difference. So you could do that with almost anything. So it's, sometimes it's sort of the strategy, the approach the teacher takes. The same thing with Veronica with the identity uh, portraits is the kind of questions she's asking and really listening to the children and hearing what they're saying and, and sort of uh, feeding it back to them. Uh, I think these are important strategies in anti-bias work. No, thank you both for that. Um, and if you're just tuning in, this is the narrative here on KRSM Radio. I am speaking with John Nimmo and Debbie Lee Keenan. We're talking about their film that they have um, called Reflecting on Bi Anti-Bias Education in Practice, The Early Years. Um, very insightful from film that you made just about anti-bias education. And I love that it says in practice because this is a practice and it's something that we all need to work on is how we can do anti-bias training um I always say like how we all can uphold white supremacy in certain ways we can also work on you know making sure we're not upholding the patriarchy yeah. and anti-bias structures so um you know, this film was released for free streaming. Why was it important for you to make sure that this resource was accessible to a wide audience? And how do you envision it being used in the field of early childhood education? We have been overwhelmingly surprised and happy that the response to the film has been so overwhelmingly positive. We've had pushback, but it's been overwhelmingly positive. It's seen all over the world in every state, I always say red states, blue states, purple states, um, and particularly where there has been pushback, um, generally in states like, I'm thinking of Florida, we've, we've screened it, we've shared it, done workshops in Florida, Oklahoma, Arizona, Wyoming, and people have found it very hopeful, you know, because even in these places where we think, you know, the, the media is telling us, or we know politically there's a lot of stuff going on, <laughs> that there are still people doing this work. And what I've heard personally is that people are saying, this gives me hope. These are the tools we need. So um, you, you look, I always say, we're looking for those little cracks where these yes. lights of sun, sunlight can grow and grow the, the seeds that are coming up through the ground. Um, and they're there. And so it's it's very rewarding to see that, that even in places where, you know, they're worried about doing it, that the film has given them some opportunities. Again, as we've already said, the mention is, it, it is a provocation. It's not trying to say, you know, do what you see in the film, you know, because some people can also say, oh, we could never do that or for this reason or that reason. Well, these teachers were able to do it in these contexts, you know, because that's what they had. What do you have? Where is your entry point? What's the one small step you can take? You know, what do you feel comfortable? Uh, which area of social identity or how are you going to get started? Um, so I think to me, that's one of the reasons we wanted it free and accessible to get out there and be and and get and get that impact. And as I already mentioned, also not just in educational settings. We found business settings. The comment there I've shared is, you know, well, if the kids, what we hear from them is if the kids can do this, mm. we should be able to do this, or we should do this. I <laughs> think one of our one of our biggest goals was which I think we succeeded with 
with, with was to present a very powerful image of young children, you know, that they're um, very capable, they're very curious, um, they're trying to make sense of the world around them, um, they're very interested in who they are and who the people are around them, and also project a very capable image of teachers, you know, that teachers are reflective, that they are dealing with very complex situations, they're thinking about who they are, their social identities and how they bring into the classroom. So in a way, the film, by making it, um, you know, freely available, it's almost like an advocacy tool too. So you could, I could see teachers using this with uh, policymakers. In fact, I've used it with policymakers. Uh, here in Portland, we presented it as part of a discussion for a new, they have a project called Preschool for All, which is universal preschool in our county. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, kind of, uh, starting places for that was to engage people in a conversation of what is quality early child education. So we've shown uh, that film, we've shown other films to sort of raise those issues about what would it really look like if we were going to um, have early child education that reflected children and really uh, understood what they're encountering out in the world around them, in the society around them. So it, it's also an advocacy tool. And also it's conveniently under one hour, so you can use it in a class or a workshop uh, very easily and engage in a conversation. And it does bring up a lot of different questions for sure. Um, and it is engaging just to see how the children do respond to it. And, you know, you do see the teachers doing a lot of those, repeating back what the students say back to them um, in a curious tone. Um, and one thing that I did notice for sure is the tone of the teachers as they are engaging with the students. It's not admonishing. It's more curious in my opinion. And I don't know if that's the right word, but that's that's what my heart says is curiosity that they that they say back to them. Um, and what a, a great tool to use with young people. And I kind of wish that I knew that when my kids were younger, um, especially when they said things that kind of scared me maybe, or that I wasn't really expecting was to rather, instead of fear, maybe be more curious. Um, so yeah. there's certain questions here for Little Moments Count that they always want us to ask. And, you know, because we're always talking about 80% of the child's brain development and architecture happens in those first three years of life. So what can parents do to maximize their child's brain development? And maybe I'm asking you this more within that um, anti-bias framework here. Yeah. Well, the first thing I think about is, you know, just paying attention to children, even when they're infants, right, when they're babies, that whole, uh, I know you have it on the Little Moments uh, website, but that the whole idea of that serve and return, right, that if a baby cries, if a baby smiles, that we as caregivers or family members, you respond, and then it's like throwing that ball back and forth, so the, the baby throws it to you, or the child, and you throw it back, and so that those interactions are really powerful, so I think about doing that in my everyday life, what I'm noticing um, with my, right now I have great little grandchildren uh, when I was a parent, but also thinking about, you know, what narrating, I call it narrating what I'm doing in my, when I'm giving a bath, when I'm eating, when I'm in the park, when I'm in the car, you know, just what I'm noticing. Oh, look at that orange. It's round and rough. Hmm. What else do I see here? Or if they're older, what you know? What else can we find that's round and rough? Um, and then obviously going same for people, right? You know, oh, I, let's who who's in the park today? Or you know, as we're just talking, what do I see? Ah, who's the same? Who's how are they the same as us? How are they different? So that idea of going back and forth with dialogue, I don't feel it's good to ask lots of questions at children right away, but you know, I just share what I notice and then yeah. what do you think? You know, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. Andrea, I thought you hit the nail on the head when you said you earlier you're saying about a pro being a curious parent, being a curious mm -hmm. teacher, and that that can be really helpful when children say things that you're perplexed by, or you're a little bit maybe unsure about whether they should be saying that, that if you take a curiosity approach, you sort of join, you sort of alongside of them. And I think that's uh, a really powerful part of being a, a good parent and uh, thinking about brain development is that is, is approaching it as curiosity. So not 
not always if children ask questions you don't have to answer the question and it's done you actually can think about how do you expand the question by wondering with them well i wonder maybe we could find some information about that or uh, what do you think uh, how, how could we uh, think about this um i, I think the other part is um so you're when saying you don't, about, don't try to be a perfect parent, John? Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting. We're doing uh, we're doing a new film uh, that we've got funding from the same organization, foundation, Tyler Rigg, uh, which is families engaging in anti-bias education. Mm -hmm. And parents really get that more than teachers, actually, that they don't know what they're doing all the time and they're trying to figure it out and they're not trying to be experts. I think sometimes teachers, unfortunately, um, they perceive that they're supposed to be experts all the time and know exactly why they're doing what they're doing. Um, sure, they may be very more intentional and they're writing down plans, but I think they could learn something from families about, you know, I'm trying to do the best I can in this particular situation and every child is different. The other part of, you know, with brain development, I think is getting your children out and about. Um, and again, that's come up in our new film is following families that they don't just go to school, they go to the park, they go to the farmer's market, they walk around the neighborhood, they hang out with extended family for a celebrations, they go to a community center. So I think right from, you know, I know different cultures have ideas about how old children should be before you take them out. But I know with my own children, they were out when they were babies and toddlers out in the community, seeing people, interacting with people. That's how they're getting their information, particularly if like me, you know, as a, a white family, we were living in a community that in Seattle that wasn't particularly diverse. I don't know if you know how much you know about Seattle, but there are the same divisions like in many cities. So we were very conscious and intentional about taking our family into many different contexts so they could observe and then they ask the questions right that you maybe don't want them to ask but mm -hmm. you know like I can still remember uh, going into a um, a restaurant near where I worked and my daughter who was uh, two I think she was less than two she stood up and said hey daddy how come everyone here is black you know and of course <laughs> I I immediately is going through my mind, okay, I can't tell her about the history of, you know, redlining and so forth, but I can respond to that and say, yeah, you did notice that and this is why. And, you know, mm -hmm. we continue the conversation. That's real. That's very real. Um, I'm, tr I'm trying to just kind of remember um, just like the, the benefits of that too, of just really exposing your child to different people and, I'm not trying to remember, but there are just a lot, a lot of benefits of exposing your children to different types of people, different types of food, different types of cultures, particularly when they're young. And I feel like that was really happening over and over again in the film uh, when they were talking about the way that different people look, when they were talking about like, oh, this person's Somali or this person's from Oromo. And then the teacher was really yeah. correcting the way that they even said the name of that particular type of people. Um, it was just really beautiful the way that they kept on reinforcing and honoring different traditions and cultures and ethnicities in a very respectful way. So I really appreciated that as well. Um, I'm kind of remembering too, just my children taking them to art museums and things like that and yeah. using that tool as a tool to talk about race or just having difficult conversations as well, um, just from the, de the depictions, because some of those depictions are violent, are even um, racist. <laughs> so yeah. just using Which those. Are... Yeah. Tool. And you and you can talk to a four year old. You can say, you know, I, I think that's unfair. Does that look right to you? Mm -hmm. You know, does that look like our family or you know, uh, um, our friends? Uh, so mm -hmm. you can engage in a conversation. You know, you talked earlier about people being worried about, um, you know, children talking about really difficult things. And, you know, because racism involves violence. We know that. You know, and mm -hmm. a, and a, a history of violence and a reality of violence. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, sexism. And if we think about gender expression uh, for what trans folks are, are dealing with. So, but there are, you know, developmentally appropriate ways to engage in that conversation. And um, I think the idea that children have to always feel comfortable is uh, really problematic because children are quite capable of a range of emotions if you're alongside them supporting them helping them to make sense of something so you know you talked about yes when talking about 
uh, what was happening in Minneapolis, there are many things about a three-year-old that maybe you want to protect them from, but there's still a way of engaging in the conversation. Why are people angry? What's mm -hmm. happening that's unfair? How would you like things to be different? Um, you know, being able to talk about the police and the reality that while the police are supposed to be protecting us, they're not always protecting us. And children can engage in those conversations and the world's not always so binary as we think it has to be. You know, it's either this way or that way. So I'd say, you know, start those conversations early and really look to them to see when they're satisfied with the answer, whether they have additional questions um, that you need to continue on. Yeah, and the research tells us, right, that children, even as like six months of age, they prefer same race faces. So mm -hmm. what does that mean for us, depending on, you know, your own social identity or what your children are being exposed to, even babies. So it's earlier than you think where children are trying to make sense of this and either going to have internalized um, you know, oppression or internalized superiority. So we want to be aware of that, that these early years developmentally, this is the time um, to expose children to, you know, uh, of course, in the film, it's or organized around those four goals of identity, diversity, justice, and action. Hmm. And that's one way to think about how do I implement anti-bias education, whether it's in the home or in the school or in your own life as adults. Adults, have, right, we're all doing this also, you know, feeling good about who we are, understanding people who are different than us. That's the goal about diversity. Just the third goal about justice is this unfairness. We're talking about what's fair or unfair. And then that fourth goal is about action or empowerment. I like to talk about that too. You know, uh, what can I do about it? How can I stand up for myself or stand up for my friend or others? So those goals are a good guidepost, I think, to really think about what does this look like in action? What does anti-bias work look like in action, as I said, for adults or ch and children? About. And also, you're just not leaving it where look at all this bad stuff that's happening. No, you're ending on empowerment. You're ending on a an action okay. plan on what you can do, you know, mm -hmm. um, how you can build yourself up or how you can help others. And that's that's the least we all can do is either try to help others or, you know, at least try to do some self-improvement, too, for ourselves. Um what a great movie. What a great film. What's next? What's the future plans or goals in promoting this anti-bias work? I know you said you have another film coming up, but, um, you know, I'm just really interested both the United States and globally. Like, what do you guys both have come up next? Well, in addition to the film that John mentioned that we're, we're working on, we hope it to be released again for free streaming in 2024. Um, we also have a, a book coming out, uh, a revision of a leading anti-bias early childhood programs. A guide for change to ch a guide to change for change, um, and that's coming out in uh, September uh, in October uh, from Teachers College Press. It's more for uh, the leaders' book. The uh, what, what do leaders need to do? There's are materials out there, and what should classroom teach? Or there's more out there for teachers. Let's put it that way. Um, and uh, Louise Derman Sparks, our mentor, and. Uh, the guru of anti-bias education in the United <laughs> States. Um, you know, she uh, invited us to work with her to develop a book for leaders, you know, of, uh, what was that done? 2013, 14, 15. 14, yeah. And now we, we just did a new revision of that. So we're excited about that. And then I think we're both, I'm doing a lot of uh, conference presentations and sharing this work. Um, about anti-bias education at all these levels for leaders, for teachers, for families mm -hmm. um, at our national conferences and other, um, uh, actually the World Forum, you want to, uh, international conferences. Also. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, the World Forum deal. of Early yeah, early Care and Education is in Vancouver, Canada um, next April. So we'll be presenting some things. What we're trying, we're doing right now is kind of test running uh, little clips for the second film on families, showing families talking about in their own homes, talking about anti-bias and social justice work. So I'm working, uh, Debbie's been doing work, as you know, in Minneapolis. I'm, I'm actually working with a school, wonderful public element, uh, public early child school in Chicago. Um, so, you know, we're continuing to kind of do that work. And it's always interesting if we search on the film online, we'll find 
all these people doing workshops and things that we had no idea about, oh, wow. which is to us is like, that's great. You know, yes, we're doing our own work, but we can only do so much. And I know I'm Australian. I know the film has been um, shown a lot in Australia and in and the UK and in um, Europe and, and other, and Brazil. Uh, it's translate, change, <laughs> it's translated into Chinese and Spanish. So that's helped with that kind of accessibility. So um I, I think we have a lot of thoughts in our mind. We're certainly very deeply involved in this family film, which has had its own um, challenges because uh, we're going into people's homes and really that has taken a lot of effort to develop the kind of trusting relationships we need. And, you know, we're always aware with the, the first film and with this film, we can't represent everyone and uh, we have to be conscious of that, that we're telling story, trying to tell stories about, a smaller group of people that we hope raises uh, different areas of di identity and, and different issues. But we're always conscious of the fact that um, there's many other stories to tell, right? You know, the danger of the single story. Um, yeah. You need a so big disclaimer at the beginning. <laughs> well, we, yeah, well, we, we, we do. And we, we, you know, we have the guidebook, uh, which allows us because when in print, it's very much easier to be inclusive, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, than it is on a film, because if you tried to have uh, all the areas of diversity, you'd end up with two seconds on everyone, and then it would still be impossible. I mean, for me personally, because um, of my own work, I've, you know, I I was disappointed that we weren't able to bring forward, say, Indigenous voices in the mm -hmm. film. But you don't invent those relationships. They take time and it's complex. Uh, with the family film, we're aware of um, that there are some families we're not accessing because sometimes they're very vulnerable families. And this is not a, a we want this film to be a powerful image and we don't want to add to anyone's, you know, trauma, you know. So we're we're very mindful of that the families we're involving in this film are families that are fairly feel very good about themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're, we're by, by the nature of doing that and trying to make a film that's very empowering and, and um, trustworthy that sometimes we're not representing everyone who's out there in the world. So we have to constantly be saying that, right. Who's not how, here. I can definitely see how it could be hard to not make it um, be performative and. Yep. And also, it, it kind of brings me just to another question of, um, you know, intersectionality is so hard. Um, I'm noticing a lot of different groups are um, even kind of turning against each other. You know what I mean? Um, when we're seeing people of different identities that are also part of, you know, um, minority groups that are don't they have a lack of trust. Um, they are turning against each other. It seems like we're fighting over resources, maybe even to um, how can we maintain anti-bias work while when we're fighting over these resources, actually, you know, how can we really maintain this? We talk a lot about conflict also, you know, we talked a little bit about discomfort and falling down and making mistakes. I think to me, it's also about, you know, there's when you do anti-bias work, there's always going to, it's about values, perspectives. And we say, yes, we want to embrace them, but it doesn't mean anything goes, right? There are bottom lines. So sometimes when there's disagreements, you know, depending on what those, they can be uh, ideological disagreements, it could be resource-based um, disagreements. But when those come, you try to have to figure out, well, what kind of disagreement is this disequilibrium? What kind of conflict is it? Is it something that we can find some common ground? Can we try to work it through? So, you know, in schools, I think about sometimes the home feels one way, the, teach, the school is feeling another way, and the child's caught in the middle. So you don't want that. So you kind of work with the families and the school to try to figure out that common ground. Sometimes, you know, as we see all these laws that are coming up <laughs> in, you know, all these uh, pushback laws, the, you know, critical race, all these things that are out there right now, you know, it's very threatening for, for teachers to feel comfortable. How can I do this? Should I, I want to do it, but I can't do it, you know? Yeah. So um, it's finding that it, sometimes you can't find the common ground. I guess that's what I'm trying to say here is that um, you agree to disagree, you figure out what you can do. And I always say one step in front of the other, that sometimes you can take big steps. You're in a situation where you have the 
power or you have the ability, you have the resources, you have the community to take big structural steps. And sometimes you don't, it's small things. I think yeah. that's important to keep, to keep that hope and keep, um, you know, Interesting yeah, when, when, times we're in right now. Interesting yeah, times. Yeah. I mean, I, when I think of when you're saying about people competing for resources, that's one of the dynamics of oppression, right? Is that you, mm -hmm. if you want to maintain white supremacy, if you want to maintain other forms of supremacy, you get folks to uh, think that they have to fight each other. So I think um, for us with anti bias work, everything isn't happening in the classroom with the young children. The adults have to also be doing the work. So there's the community of teachers. There's a community of teachers with families. Um, and some of that is to have hard conversations about um, how these dynamics are operating in your community and what's happening. They may not be have conversations you have with young children because as adults, we have responsibility. You know, children, five-year-olds don't have the responsibility uh, to turn the world around, right? They're part of that as they grow up and they need the tools for it. But adults have to do that work too. So we have to think about uh, what does it mean to be a teacher or a family member who's an activist and, and talk about that. But I, I think also the anti-bias approach is trying to deal more with um, this complexity of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people talk about an anti-racist approach. And, and we understand why, because race has been so potent in the history of the United States and in the world. Um, but anti-bias also looks at the intersections with uh, with gender expression and classism and so forth. And so that, I think, is one thing that can be brought into the conversation by anti-bias work is sort of looking at that intersectionality and what does that mean? Um, I think the last thing, you know, that Debbie brought up was about the laws and policies uh, they call this educational intimidation policies. And it's intimidation because sometimes it actually isn't stopping a teacher from doing something, but it it, it creates self-censorship. So we find even in places where, well, there's no law here or whatever, or even if there is a law, it's going to be challenged. Uh, it creates this chilling effect. So we've been yeah. thinking a lot about that and kind of opening up that conversation of why do you feel unsafe as a teacher having that conversation? Uh, why are you self-censoring yourself when you maybe even don't even know where the parents are coming from in relationship to this idea? So um, there's that part of the anti-bias work is being aware <laughs> of, like you say, these challenging times where all these narratives, you know, the narrative about children can't talk about race because it makes them feel uncomfortable. You know, those kind of things uh, we have to be... Um, upfront and explicit about you know yeah. anti-bias education isn't sort of the you know everything is happy and we're getting on together that's why it says anti-bias very very um intentional to have that word there is to say yes we want children to feel good about who they are but we have to consciously be thinking about constantly thinking about there is bias in the world and how are we going to counter that wow just thank you both again what a insightful conversation you give me plenty of things to kind of mull over through my day and just actually to just thinking about how I show up in my spaces as I do my role in community um am I showing up as a anti-bias uh advocate for my community and uh my family you know um John Nemo Nemo <laughs> I'm so sorry, John. Don't hurt me. John Nimmo. Well, I was I was going to call you Andrea, but now it's Andrea. So, you know, sorry, we're, it's sorry, the same John thing. <laughs> so John Nimmo and Debbie Lee Keenan, um, just so happy anti-bias folks. Uh, if you can, please check out Reflecting on Anti-Bias Education in Practice, the early years, and look out for more works from them. Did you both need to give out any social medias or anything like that to people if they wanted to know more about you? Yeah. You can check out our, our website, Anti-Bias leaders ece.com everything's on there <laughs> perfect <Lots of> <laughs> resources <laughs> Good perfect work. perfect so thanks for listening to the narrative you can hear a recording of this show at littlemomentscount.org backslash podcast and if you'd like to learn more about little moments count you can visit their website at littlemomentscount.org thank you so much again john yeah. and debbie and keep on up with the good fight thank you thank you That's thanks for your work thank in the you. community 
Thanks for listening to the Little Moments Count radio podcast in partnership with community radio stations throughout Minnesota. You can find the Little Moments Count radio podcast wherever you get your podcasts and at littlemomentscount.org slash podcast.